Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today, we are very pleased to talk with the distinguished philosopher and freethinker, Daniel C. Dennett, about his brand new autobiography. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on freethinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. What's it like to devote your entire life to philosophy? Our guest today will tell us. The famous philosopher Daniel C. Dennett is a leading figure in academia as well as an eloquent popularizer of philosophical ideas. He is University Professor Emeritus at Tufts University and the author of many books, including Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Consciousness Explained, Intuition Pumps and Other Tools for Thinking, and the best-selling Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. Because of that book, Daniel Dennett has been described as one of the four horsemen of the new atheism. And Dan Dennett has received FFRF's Emperor Has No Clothes Award and is an FFRF Honorary Director who's also studied the phenomenon of clergy losing their religion in the pulpit. Daniel Dennett's newest book, Just Out, is the autobiography called I've Been Thinking. And what a great title for a life of philosophy. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters, Dan Dennett. Delightful to be back with you, and, and thank you. Uh, yeah, I thought that title, when it hit me, I thought, oh, that's perfect. That's what I want. <laughs> well, that's what you have been doing. So I love your book. It's a fascinating read, sort of behind the curtain about a life in philosophy. Is, is this a painting on the front cover? Yeah, it is. It's a painting by an Italian portrait painter named Luca Del Baldo. He's a lovely man. And he did it from a photograph that my wife took of me a few years ago. Well, your book is just a, a fun for people who like to think. And I was surprised, uh, many places in your book, uh, you, you say that you've enjoyed a very lucky life and a happy life. And I'm guessing you wouldn't call that fate, but, but what is luck? Is luck maybe a kind of determinism? Luck is a good topic. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky one, and philosophers have, have stumbled over it, I think, again and, and again. Um, uh, my favorite way of getting people to see what luck isn't is to imagine a little uh, coin tossing calling tournament. Suppose we were to decide to settle the, the Ukrainian war by having a coin toss between, uh, uh, say, us and, 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 the, and Russia. And we send our representative, they send theirs. Uh, somebody might say, well, look, let's have a, a coin tossing tournament, an elimination tournament, and the person who wins will have will have won, I don't know, we will have to figure out the powers of two. The two to the 30th will have, will have won 30 coin tosses in a row without a loss. Surely that's the person to send to, uh, to Russia to represent us. No, that's just bad thinking. Luck doesn't work that way. Uh, 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 it doesn't accumulate. Luck has no memory. The idea that some people are lucky is it's a fact that one has to treat very gingerly because um, your luck may change tomorrow. 
Well, you say, <laughs> you say you've lived a very lucky life, and it looks like you have. However, it wasn't very lucky, was it, that your father was killed? Your father was the first CIA, CIA agent to be killed on duty. We talked with your sister Charlotte about that on one of our shows. So, yeah. so that must have impacted your life in a very big way. It did. It did. I, uh, I loved my dad. I was only five years old when he died, but I, was, I just adored him. And we had some wonderful adventures together. So it was a big blow. Uh, but um, my mother and my sisters and I carried on, and he had many wonderful friends who helped her and us in, in ways uh, too numerous to mention. A few of them get discussed in the book. Yeah. But otherwise, why, why do you say you're lucky? I was thinking the other day, of all the people that have been alive during my life that I w really would like to get to know or, or talk with and learn from, you know, how many of them have I actually met and know? And the answer is almost all of them. Huh. If, if I uh, think, okay, who do I really regret never having, you know, had lunch with or, or shaking his or her hand? There are a few. Uh, um, uh, Nelson Mandela comes to mind. And <laughs> I would love to have had a meal with Nelson Mandela. Um, uh, Barack Obama is another. Um, well, maybe that will still happen. That could, yes. Yeah. With, with, luck. with luck. With luck. <laughs> with luck. With luck will happen, yeah. Well, so you're not just a philosopher. I didn't realize that you're also a musician and an artist. Do you still play jazz piano and make sculptures? Um, I wish I could say yes, but my arthritis means that my piano playing is is just torture for me. I mean, not so much that it hurts. It hurts my ears because I just can't do what I want to do anymore. Sometimes I sneak over to the Steinway Grand and and noodle away a little bit. It doesn't make me want to do it more anymore. That's that's, that's a shame. Well, you know, and, and for sculpture, my uh, uh, my hand strength isn't what it used to be. So although I still do some whittling, that's about it. Well, what did you sculpture? All kinds of things. I worked in metal. I, I, I did some bronze casting. I built out of metal, and uh, I uh, worked in wood a lot, and even in stone, got some marble in, in Greece, pandelic, pandelic marble. In recent years, my uh, sculpture has been little, uh, what, I, what I call haptic whittles. <laughs> haptic meaning something you handle. And these are things that when you see them, you want to pick them up and handle them. You want to see because they have moving parts. It's, there are variations on that old Hitler's theme of you know, making a chain of links out of a single uh, piece of wood or making a, a, a ball inside a cage. Uh, and I have some uh, sort of really uh, uh, very complicated and hard to make whittles. But I did, them, I did them all with whittling, no cheating, no gluing it, all made out of one piece of wood. And you write in your book that you studied with some well-known sculptors in Italy, actually. You actually were doing the real yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah uh, it was Pietro Consagra in Rome. He had won the Venice Biennale for his sculpture in, uh, that must have been about 19... Uh, 59 or 60, and I went and uh, sort of apprenticed in his studio uh, one summer in the summer of 1961 and learned about lost wax casting and about uh, uh, sand casting. Wow. He, most of his works were sand cast in those days, and I actually got to work on, on some of them with him, in a sense supervise the casting in the foundry, which was... Uh, one of my favorite adventures. So do you think philosoph your philosophy is like sculpting ideas? Oh, yeah. And, and, and I've said as much. In Elbow Room, my first book on free will, I, uh, I said that my method was sculptural. Uh, if you're a draftsman, uh, if, you're, if you're an artist who's got to draw a beautiful 
a beautiful line drawing with a pencil, let's say, or with a pen. You got to get it right the first time. You know, you can't go scrubbing and erasing and changing it. But if you're a sculptor, you can nibble away until you rough it out. And that's the way I've done philosophy all my all my life. I I I don't rush in with a big definition. I go around and turn it over in my head and look at different sides and nibble away and find little bits that are promising. And so, yeah, it's, it's been very, and it's been self-conscious. I, I always recommended this method of philosophy. And uh, uh, it means that, uh, uh, you know, for one thing, you don't tend to get a sort of writer's block or thinker's block that some philosophers get. As I tell my students, just blurt something out, then you'll have something to fix. So, well, I learned a lot in your book, but I have to tell you my favorite part of your whole book is when you're talking about the clergy who don't believe. On page 298, you call me a hero. <laughs> because yes. well, and so you are. Linda Lascola, a qualitative researcher, had the bright idea of seeing if we could find some closeted, non-believing atheist clergy that still had their pulpits, were still, were still uh, 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 had congregations. And we did, thanks to you. You were our main lifeline to getting us in touch with these wonderfully heroic, but also shockingly lonely and in pain, people who go into the ministry for the best of reasons. They want to lead a good life. They want to do good. They want to help other people. And the only path they see is by becoming a, 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 a cleric, becoming a clergy person. They get in, they go to seminary, and they, what? They don't, they're not sure they believe this stuff. It isn't like Sunday school. And the they learn that the Bible is not the inerrant word of God, but a political uh, palimpsest of many different uh, uh, texts put together and wrestled over for centuries. And, and they, the lucky ones, say, I'm out of here. I'm going to do something else with my life. The unlucky ones say, I'll figure out how to make this work. Huh. And they go on, and they they get they get ordained, and they have a, a congregation. And a, there's no fine line between diplomacy, which we all engage in. Oh, you look beautiful today, my dear," said to the ugly old lady. Um, the line between diplomacy and outright hypocrisy and lying is there's no fine there's no bright line there and pretty soon they've told so many lies they've they've baptized so many babies and presided over so many funerals and weddings and they don't believe what they're saying well, and that book is called the, they get caught in the pulpit they get caught and they get caught by their own goodness hmm. and well, we found them, thanks to Dan, mainly, and others. And we did a short, we got a small grant, and uh, Linda did all the interviews, and she's a, a brilliant, very sympathetic interviewer. When we published our first study, well, in, uh, among other things, in the Washington Post on Faith column, we treated the clergy we talked with so sympathetically that just what we wanted to happen happened. And we not only interviewed six and only five of them made it into that first article because one got cold feet and wanted out. But we were basically inundated with letters and calls and emails from clergy who said, well, those are five wonderful stories, but wait till you hear mine. I want to, I, they volunteered. So then we had a, we could, we could have interviewed, well, over, over 100. We didn't. But we interviewed dozens. Well, because of that, you and Richard Dawkins and Linda were instrumental in, in forming the Clergy Project, which is now a group 
clergyproject.org, where people like that can go to find help. Along so. with you, Dan. And yeah. we'll put that website up in case there is somebody caught in the pulpit right now to find oh, out yeah. more about that support. And we are going to have to take a break. We are talking with the very eminent philosopher and scholar Daniel C. Dennett about his new autobiography called I've Been Thinking. And when we come back, Dan, we want to talk a little bit about consciousness and the meaning of life. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name's Jarvis and I'm an out of the closet atheist. There are many reasons why I'm an atheist, but I'll start with the crudest explanation. I'm sure many of you have seen Clash of the Titans or The Immortals or 300, these blockbuster films about ancient Greek or Roman religion, which we now call mythology. But back then it wasn't mythology. It was very real for them. They genuinely believed that you had to put a coin in a person's mouth before they were buried so that they could pay for the literal ferry to the afterlife. Just as many people today believe that they should eat crackers and wine on a Sunday or that God wants women to hide their bodies under black burqas. Every religion that has ever existed, and there are many, have all believed that they were right, that their rituals and rules and beliefs were 100% correct. And they all thought they nailed it. But where are they today? Uh, if they're not completely forgotten, they're on the silver screen, amusing us with their sword fights, animal sacrifices, and oracles. The religions of today are the entertainment of tomorrow. Everyone, I hope, is an atheist about Zeus and Apollo, Juno and Poseidon. I just added Jesus and Muhammad to that list. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker and with Annie Lloyd Gaylor, and we're talking with the eminent philosopher Daniel C. Dennett. He's an expert on philosophy, on consciousness. He's been called one of the four horsemen of the new atheism. He's author of the best-selling book, Breaking the Spell. He's now written an autobiography called I've Been Thinking. So I read your book, Dan, uh, Consciousness Explained, years ago. I really loved that. And the one takeaway I got from that book was, was when you described consciousness as the center of narrative gravity. It's not some spooky thing. Do you still say that? I'm happy to have hit on that metaphor. A center of gravity, is it a real thing? Well, yes and no. It's not an atom. It's not made of carbon or, or iron or anything else. It's an abstraction, but it's perfectly real, as anybody who's ever dipped over a canoe or <laughs> knows. Uh, center of gravity is a well-behaved concept. And what I wanted to say is what a self is, is a center of narrative gravity. Each of us has a self. Each of us is a many trillions of moving parts, many trillions. As you sit there in, in, in your in your nice clothes and breathing and 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 uh, uh, listening and talking, it's almost unimaginable how many different parts are in action to make this possible. So we have this wonderful, simplified, in fact, oversimplified, usefully way of thinking of each other as a person, a person, a self the author of the speech acts that pour out of our mouths or from our typewriters or, or, or computers. Uh, so the concept of the self 
the ego, the I, as an abstraction, which is maintained thanks to the activity of trillions of moving parts at the subpersonal level, ribosomes and motor proteins and neurons and all the rest. It's a, it's a wonderful abstraction, and it helps us get away from the eternally uh, inviting, tempting idea that we have this show going on inside our heads with this sort of Cartesian theater, I call it, uh, in, in our brains where all the consciousness happens. That's the way it seems, and that's not what's going on. Well, and, and it's not a soul or a spirit either. It's a, it's a physical no. thing, yeah. Yeah. It's a physical thing. If you're tempted to think that the neurons send all their information up to some special place where that gets translated back into, you know, uh, uh, colors and sounds and snap smells and so forth, no. There's no second transduction into another medium. It's spike trains all the way. Huh. Uh, uh, but out of all of that, activity comes this incredibly interesting and complicated and informative uh, sort of set of metaphors about what's actually going on. Our thought is inexorably metaphorical. Uh, atoms aren't colored. <laughs> Red, blue, green, they exist, but, but, but not as intrinsic properties of matter. That's just one part of the user illusion that we have of physical reality. I do want to turn the topic to something you often get asked. What is the meaning of life? How do you answer that, Dan? I answer that question by saying, you don't want to do trickle-down economics here. You don't want to do trickle-down meaning of life. Uh, it's amazing to me how many people think, oh, if God doesn't exist, or if my, if I don't have an immortal soul made of some special extra kind of stuff, then life has no meaning. Well, that's the, you might call that the trickle-down theory of importance. We can only be important if something even more important and wonderful and supercalifragilisticexpialidocious is the cause of it. No, the cause of it is the physical universe without any meaning, without any purpose. It's blind mechanical trial and error. But that has made wonderful things like you and our friends and democracy and art and music. All these fantastic phenomena, they're all products of a churning an ultimately Darwinian process. And why isn't that meaning enough? Why can't we have a bubble up theory of meaning instead of a trickle down theory of meaning? Oh. I mean, in other words, we give ourselves the meaning. Yeah, and who better to do it? <laughs> I take the word of some imaginary uh, fellow in, on a throne in heaven up for what's important. We decide what's important, and we have good reasons for deciding what's important, because we love and we care. So instead of top down, it's it's bottom up. Wow. Bottom up. Yeah. So, That's Darwin's strange inversion of reasoning. In your book, you you tell stories of engaging with other thinkers and sometimes disagreeing strongly with a lot of thinkers, but in spite of the fierce battles you have, you, you tend to maintain a cordial and friendly atmosphere with them. Uh, is philosophy still always going to have that flux in, in conflict and challenging to it? I think it probably will. I mean, philosophers, uh, in spite of our, of our caricature uh, as uh, super reflective nasal, navel gazers, a lot of philosophers are remarkably unreflective about what the heck they're doing with their lives. <laughs> they're, they're caught in some academic games that they get very good at, and these matter so much to them that they sort of lose track of why they're doing this. 
And are they doing it for fame? Are they doing it because they think they're going to make some earth-shaking discovery? Maybe. But philosophers as, as a group are not very uh, good at recognizing a lot of their own foibles and problems. Uh, and I'm sure that's true of me, too. Uh, there's uh, lots of things that I can gloss over, uh, <laughs> mistakes that I make, weaknesses that I have that I don't really uh, uh, fully uh, vow up to and, and accept. Well, we only have a minute left, so this isn't really fair, but how do you describe your moral philosophy? How do you know what is right and wrong? Well, I think I just had a good upbringing in school. I, 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 I learned the importance of not telling lies and being honest and being, being gentle with people and not, not being overly aggressive or mean. And uh, I've made plenty, and of course I've made plenty of mistakes. And even more important, I've been helped by my friends not to make some really bad mistakes. There's nothing like a good friend to stop you in your tracks and say, hang on, hang on, Dan. You're about to make a really bad mistake. And that's happened several times in my life. I'm very grateful to my friends who have uh, uh, steered me clear when I was not at my best. Well, thank you, Dan Dennett, uh, for being with us today. The book is called I've Been Thinking. Thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you. As always, a great pleasure to talk with both of you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.